Thank you again, Chris and Solidarity Health Share for helping sponsor as our, as our presenting sponsor. We really appreciate it. We're grateful to have you here with us. So now to introduce our keynote speaker for the evening. Harry Kramer is executive partner at Madison Dearborn Partners, a private equity firm based in Chicago, Illinois, and a clinical professor of management and strategy at Northwestern University's Kellogg School of Management. He was named the 2008 Kellogg School Professor of the Year. He's also an author of two best-selling leadership books, one of which he's actually given uh, enough copies so that every single one of you can have a copy here this evening. Um, and I'll tell you more about how to get that. So please help me now in welcoming Harry Kramer. Well, good evening, everybody. Good evening, everybody. It is, uh, it is my honor and privilege to uh, have the opportunity to, to spend time with you this evening. And uh, the, the thought really was to talk a little bit about uh, the booklet that is included in all of your packages. And I don't know if folks have had a chance to see it yet, but this whole focus on practicing the presence of God, uh, I, I found to be pretty remarkable. And this is something that this brother wrote uh, almost 400 years ago, and again, as everybody's busy, taking a little bit of time to think about the concepts that she just mentioned, and that we're all very, very busy, we've all got a tremendous amount of things to do, but literally taking the time to realize our real calling is that in everything we do every day, every day, every moment, we think about what we do in, in the presence of God. And I'll give you a couple of examples, because we all have our own little journeys, but I've had uh, several things that have happened to me that have, have really sort of reinforced this. And I'll, uh, I'll mention a couple of these to you. So the, the first thing that happened, and it shows uh, what happens during your life, but, but many years ago, my uncle was a priest, and uh, he would always get together with us every Friday night uh, to play cards, and my mother would make dinner. And I remember a couple of Sundays in a row, and I think I was 12 or 13 years old at the time, and, uh, and a couple of those Sundays, at least in my parish in Pennsylvania at the time, uh, the priest, in a very, very nice way, would talk about the fact that we, we need more priests. We just have a, a real problem. We just really, truly need more, more fathers to, to help lead us. So I, I kept listening to this, and then when my uncle, Father Francis, came to the house one Friday night, I, I grabbed him after dinner, and I said, Father Francis, I, I really need to talk to you. And he said, what's that? And he said, well, I've thought a lot about it, and I've been praying a lot about it, and uh, I've decided that I'm really going to become a priest. And he said, it's fantastic, you got a calling, this is really great. And I, because I was so close to him, I thought I could be real honest with him. I said, I, I don't really think I have a calling. In fact, as I thought about it, I, I don't really think I want to become a priest, but I thought a lot about it. And uh, being a very simple guy, I figured out the following analysis here. Uh, I'm kind of a mathematical guy. Uh, we definitely need more priests. we got this real shortage. We need them. And quite frankly, I can tell you this much. If any of my friends become a priest, we're going to have a major problem. Okay? <laughs> And uh, he literally looked at me and said, let, let, let's just take a walk. And he said, <laughs> said, said first of all, he said, I, I hope one day that you do have a calling. But he, uh, but he said, I'll tell you, let me tell you something. He said, I'll be very open with you. He said, I'm very blessed. He said, being able to become a priest has, has been the best thing that ever happened in my life, and I'm, I'm incredibly blessed every, every day. However, there's a balance in everything. And he said, one of the things that's a balance for me, he said, I end up spending a tremendous amount of my time with the people that actually come to church. And that's fantastic because they really need that. But he said, I often think to myself, what about the people who don't come to church? What about the people that are in factories and companies uh, and in sales roles and everything else? And he said, I, I really, really wish I could have an opportunity. So he said, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Whatever you end up doing, if you become a priest, fantastic. If you don't become a priest, I'm expecting you every day of your life in business meetings, financial meetings, whatever you're doing, to be an example of Christ in everything you do. And he said, a lot of people have this sort of view of, hey, my faith is really important to me, but I I'm going to have to separate this a little bit because I'll, I'll, I'll sort of focus that on the weekend or on Sundays, but, you know, I, I have to be a little careful during the week. And he said, if this is who you are, and it's really the driver of everything you do in your life, how could you possibly separate it? And so I ended up going to business school, 
I ended up going to a healthcare company called Baxter Healthcare in Chicago. I, I started as a junior financial analyst. I forgot to leave and was there for 25 years. Uh, and I have to tell you, even when I was the chairman and CEO and we had 55,000 people around the world, my major focus and the thing that I really felt best about was thinking about my uncle, Father Francis, who died a couple years later, and that everything I did every day, how I treated people, how I thought about things, the example I would set, what was really focused on that. And when I ended up leaving Baxter 12 years ago and have the opportunity uh, to come to Northwestern University at Kellogg uh, to teach leadership, I literally think about what can we do to truly be uh, value-based Catholic leaders? And what does that really mean? What does that really entail? And I, and I really do believe we all have to find ways, as busy as we all are, to take a step back and, and, and think about that. And again, read that little booklet by uh, Brother Lawrence, because I think his whole focus is so consistent with, with what the theme of this whole YCP is. Now, what this is going to take, if we're really serious about what my uncle mentioned to me, and we're serious about really living this and being an example, I think what that really requires is for all of us uh, to really focus on being value-based leaders. And it's very interesting because when I talk about leadership uh, with younger people, uh, very often, this happened in one of my classes a couple weeks ago, a young woman came up to me and said, I really want to be a leader. Harry, I really, really want to be a leader. She was very emphatic about it. But she said, Harry, I got this little problem right now. And I said, well, what's, what's the problem, Elizabeth? Well, I don't have anybody reporting to me. Uh, you know, I, 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 I've, been, I've been asking my boss, could I have a couple people, but I, I've read your books, I'm all excited, I'm ready to go, but I, I don't have any reporting to me. And what I had to explain to her, and maybe this is something as leaders you already know, is the following. Leadership has absolutely nothing to do with titles and organizational charts and whether people report to you. Here is a very, very simple model. Leadership has everything to do with the ability to influence people, to do things they may not want to do. And the only way I know how to influence people is you have to be able to relate to people. So if I can relate to you, maybe I can influence you, and I can lead you, right? So this whole idea, I've got to wait for something. We don't have to wait for anything at all. We have to step up and think about the things that Brother Lawrence talks about, things that Jesus has taught us, and we just need to get rolling. We don't have anything to wait for. Now, when I think about this and I, I meet with groups and talk to fo folks around the world, it's always interesting to me that very often senior leaders will say to me, Harry, I really wish we had more leaders. I really wish people stepped up, they took a risk, they weren't reactive, they were proactive, but, but Harry, so something seems to slow this down. And what I realized was the more organizations I saw, there seems to be a group of people in almost every organization, and you may have seen these in whatever you do, but there's a group of people that seems to slow this down because we're waiting for them. Well, we'd like to do something, but we're waiting for them. And what really surprised me is that the group of people we seem to have to wait for always has the same names. We say we have to wait for a group of people that are often referred to called those guys. <laughs> this is an amazingly large group of people, okay? <laughs> It's, it's a gender neutral term. Well, can we do something about this? Well, we have to wait for those guys. Well, who are those guys? Well, you know. No, I don't know, because if I knew, I'd do something about it. And what I try to explain to every group I talk with is at the end of the day, we are those guys. We are those guys. I think Jesus is expecting us to be those guys, right? We're the men or women who have to do something about it. And the fact that she started this organization to try to get things rolling, well, it's rolling. So now, how do you, you, help this thing go from 20 chapters to 200 chapters so that we've got millions of people involved in this? And we say, well, boy, boy, th they better get rolling. No, you are those guys. So, so this whole idea of what are we waiting for, all right? Brother Lawrence wasn't waiting for anything. And in the menial things that he did, he did it for in the presence of God. He did it because everything he did, th that was the focus point. And I think for the blink of an eye, we're here. We're, we're, we're all called to do that. And what I think that really requires is leadership. Now, what I thought I would do is to give you a couple of thoughts on, on what this means in terms of how we can all become better leaders, right? This is what I think about. This is what I write about. And here's sort of the thought process. Leadership, I believe, is not a destination. 
It isn't like a graduate degree of, okay, check the box, I'm no. No, leadership, I think, is a journey. I think every day Jesus gives us, we can all be better than the day before. Every day we're given, we can be better. And I think we're called to get better every day we're given, right? And on that journey, I've realized, I think there are four principles that if we focused on them, really focused on them, we call could become better leaders. And I'll summarize each one of these. There's, there's four of them. The first one is self-reflection or prayer. The second one is balance. The third one is true self-confidence. And I would always double underline the word true. And the fourth one is genuine humility. And I double underline the word genuine. Self-reflection, balance, true self-confidence, and genuine humility. And I'm going to summarize a little bit for each of these four. Now, in my classes at Northwestern, at the uh, graduate school, I spend about three or four hours on each one of these. But Jennifer told me this is a brilliant group of people. We can do the whole thing in about 20 minutes, OK? <laughs> so, so, so here we go. The first one, and by far and away the most important one, is self-reflection. And here's the way I, I try to get you to think about this. Even though many of you in the room I don't know, I would guess most people in this room have at least two or three times the number of things you'd like to do than you're ever going to get done. I don't mean to disappoint you on, on a Friday evening, but if you think about your schoolwork, your career, your family, your spirituality, your health, a little exercise, uh, maybe a little bit of sleep occasionally, uh, a little bit of fun, hopefully everybody in this room realizes we have a moral obligation that Jesus has asked us to make a difference in the world, right? Now, if you think about all those things, and you're as conscientious as everybody in this room, the usual reaction is, well, I'll just go faster and faster. This is where the multitasking kicks in, right? And then we got all these devices, you know, we got Blackberries, Blueberries, iPhones, iPads, <laughs> I this. The interesting thing, the great thing, the great lie about these things, my opinion, by the way, I always say no answers, opinions. Great opinion on this one is, they actually try to convince us this would make us more productive. It makes us more active, that's for sure, okay? But how productive are we? Or are we moving so fast, we have no idea how productive we are, that would take precious time we don't have, so let's just keep moving, right? Uh, we took a break for 15 minutes, I can cruise through, you know, 10 emails, 20 texts, 20 Snapchats, whatever that is. You know, we can, I, I have five children, I get these about every hour, okay? Uh, no, so we're very active, but, but how productive are we? Or are we moving so fast, we don't know? So in my mind, the very first principle of being a value-based leader is self-reflection or prayer. What that means for me is that you take a short amount of time, you turn off the noise, you get off by yourself somewhere quiet, and take the time to think about a couple of what I think of as pretty key questions. What are my values? What is my purpose? No kidding around. What really matters the short time I'm here on this earth, right? What is Jesus asking me to do? What kind of a leader do I want to be? What kind of example do I want to set for other people? Now, for myself, I'm not capable of thinking about these things when I'm doing 10 other things at the same time. I, I just can't do it. But taking a little bit of time to think about this helps me separate out activity and productivity. It helps me prioritize on what really, really matters. Okay? Now, because we can have an open discussion, and I'll try to leave a little bit of time, you can feel free to ask me any questions about this. The usual reaction that many of you may have is, well, that sounds great, sounds super, but I got this slight problem. Uh, I don't have the time. I just don't have the time. Well, here's the challenge. Is it that we don't have the time, or is this something we really, truly don't want to do? because this could get very scary very quickly, right? There could be a pretty big difference between what we say is important and what we're actually doing. Eh, we may not want to deal with that, but we're talking about leadership. And the one thing I know about leaders, they're willing to challenge themselves, they're willing to challenge one another respectfully. And by the way, uh, if we say we don't have the time, that's sort of interesting because most of us commute someplace. A lot of us try to exercise. You can do this when you're taking a jog, taking a walk. Some people, hopefully, are praying. Uh, is it we don't have the time, or is, it, or is it something we don't want to do? So this whole idea of taking a little bit of time. Now, one of my teachers always told me it's always good to explain what something is not, because that adds to the clarity. So when I say self-reflection, this is not self-absorption. This isn't studying the cosmos for hours, contemplating your navel. No, no, no. This is, what are your values? What are you going to do about it? 
okay? That's why I call it from values to action. What are you doing? Where are you going? Now, students will often say to me, well, can you give me some examples of this? Can you give me some real examples? And of course, I always say, well, I don't have any answers. I have opinions. Yeah, but can you give me an example? I'll give you an example, but I, I think there's an infinite number of ways to do this, right? Some of you may be praying early in the morning when you're taking a walk, taking a jog, commuting, whatever. The habit that I've had for almost 40 years now is I actually do a very simple self-examination at the end of every day. Right? I'm not a morning person, five children, a lot of running around, a lot of boards. For me, it's usually midnight. I'm a kind of a late night person. But I will take 15 minutes at the end of every night and go through a personal self-examination. Right? You'll concoct your own. Mine is sort of based on Ignatius of Loyola. But mine sort of goes like this. What did I say I was going to do today? What did I actually do? What am I proud of? What am I not proud of? How did I lead people? How did I follow people? If I lived today over again, what would I have done differently? And then the last one for me is if I have tomorrow, realizing sooner or later I won't, but if I do have tomorrow, based on what I learned today, how will I operate differently on everything that Jesus would have asked me to do? As a father, as a spouse, as a leader, as a follower, it just puts everything into perspective. Puts everything into perspective. And students will say, well, do you do this every day? No, I, I do it every day. Uh, if we're at a party tonight till midnight, I sort of assume 99% of you will probably brush your teeth before you go to bed because you got in that habit. This is a habit I got into 40 years ago, right? And some will say, well, do you have to write it down? I don't know if you have to write it down. I do because if I don't write it down, um, am I self-reflecting or am I just daydreaming? particularly if I've had a glass of wine. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, okay? Uh, so, so that ability to put this all together. Now, uh, the students that are pretty bright have said to me, well, you know, is this something you started doing when you were a vice president or when you were the CEO of the company? I actually started doing this when I was a student at Northwestern uh, back in the dark ages. And uh, here's, here's a little story of what happened because I, I, I was very, very lucky. Uh, I actually went to a small school in Wisconsin. Anybody from Wisconsin here, by the way? Anybody? I went to a small school, there we go, uh, Lawrence University, small uh, liberal arts school. And uh, when I, I admit this, it took me a while to admit this, but when I was a senior, I, I met a young woman who was a freshman. In fact, it was actually worse than that. I was a senior, uh, and it was her first day of school. She was 17. I had the best job on the campus. I ran the circulation desk at the library, which basically meant you could not take a book out unless I knew your name. It was super. It was an amazing job. So I, I met this young lady. I started to date her. But of course, I'm a senior, plus I graduated uh, after the first two months of senior year. So I came down to Chicago. Now, I tell my five children they can't do this now, uh, but you could do it 40 years ago, and that was I would hitchhike up to Appleton, Wisconsin, uh, which is 183 miles from Evanston, uh, every other weekend. So I, I did this for a couple months. Everything was going great until suddenly I get a phone call from her father. Very intense character. Uh, from St. Paul, Minnesota. Anybody from Minnesota here? All right, yeah. Well, uh, at the time, it was not a great thing because, <laughs> because the, the first mistake I made, it was the first weekend in December. Uh, and he said, uh, guess what? He said, I, we need to get together. I said, super, come down to Chicago. No, you come to Minnesota. Uh, we have some talking to do. I said, super, fantastic. Uh, uh, I don't have any money. I'll get you a ticket. You fly up. So. The first problem was it was the first weekend in December. Now, Minnesota, first weekend in December, we're talking 20 below zero, it's snowing, crazy. I get off the plane and I said, uh, hey Tom, you know, it's nice to meet you. He's very serious. I said, I know you've been eating, spending a lot of time with my daughter. He said, uh, we gotta talk about this. I said, super, uh, are we going to a football game, Viking, what are we doing? No, 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 no. We're, I got a plan for us this weekend. I said, super, what are we gonna do? He said, we're gonna do, he says, we're gonna go on a retreat together. <laughs> and I. And I said, what, what, what's a retreat? What, what do you have in mind? I was very quiet. And he goes, well, he said, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a retreat. And uh, I've been doing this for a number of years. And he said, uh, you're coming with me. I said, OK. Uh, now he said, there's one thing I should tell you before we start. And this is what sort of annoyed me. I said, what's that? He goes, it's a silent retreat. <laughs> and I, I said, well, I thought we were going to spend some time. No, you're going to spend some time with the Lord, OK? <laughs> and you know. My, my uncle was a pretty good guy, but he was not quite this intense. Um, so I said, what do you mean silent? He said, you can't shut up for three minutes. You will not be talking for the next three days. All right? and at that point, I had to ask myself the obvious question. 
how much do I like this guy's daughter? Okay? <laughs> because being a finance guy, I realized I could be back in Chicago in 45 minutes, but being a finance guy, sunk cost, I'm already there. I, I should, I think they taught me this in the textbook, I should at least figure this out, right? So I went on this, I just showed hands. How many of you guys have been on a silent retreat? What does that look like? Oh, perfect, okay, you guys know more about this than I do. So it was run by the, it was run by the Jesuits up in St. Paul. Very intense group of guys, okay, very intense. And there was no talking at all. In fact, it was really interesting. Of course, they talked. They were the ones who did the talking. Uh, that was another interesting piece of this. So every, every three hours, the bell would ring, and you'd run to the, trap, uh, the, the, uh, the chapel. I had 65 guys. There's all men on this one. Uh, I'd run to the chapel, and then they would give you those things to think about. You know, what, was, what does Jesus expect of you to do? How are you living your life? You know, what are your values? Pretty intense. And then once in a while, they just give you things to contemplate. So the, the one that I always remember now, this is 40 years ago, he said, uh, you're flying home. Wherever you're flying back home from, plane crashes. That's it. What would you have liked to have said to your spouse, your family, whatever? Now, if you did this here for 15 minutes, you think about it. I thought all day. I'm getting emotionally wound up about this. I'm not even on an airplane, okay? Uh, <laughs> and they have exercises. So at the very end, they said, at the very closing, after three days of not talking at all, they said, this shouldn't be a one-time exercise. You should spend 15, 20 minutes a day doing a self-examination. So I thought, hey, I'll do this for a week or two. Well, I've done this every day for 40 years. Now, the end of the story, which students at Northwestern are really trying to figure out, you know, what, what's the story here with this character. Um, the end of the story is I married his daughter, and now for the last 39 consecutive years, wherever I am in the world, and I'm usually out of the country at least a week a month, but for the last 39 years in a row, the first weekend in December, this year it's the 5th through the 8th, I fly to Minnesota and I go on this three-day retreat with my, my father-in-law, right? And I got to tell you, it has an enormous impact because in any of your roles now, in any of your jobs, whatever you're doing, no matter what you're doing, we have sort of a little plan of what we're doing over the next year or so, and then we got our day-to-day -day operational check-in, how are we doing? So once a year, I literally will spend three days thinking about what has Jesus asked me to do and how should I think about things differently as a father, as a spouse, as a Catholic, and everything that I do in my work, in my teaching, in whatever. Um, and then I kind of have my daily checkup. And of course, it's always fun because students will say, well, you, do the, you write this thing down daily. When do you have time to read this? I have three days to read this stuff, OK? <laughs> uh, which is what I do every year. So this whole idea of self refining however you decide to do it, somehow, You've got to figure out how to take enough time every day, constantly, to put things into perspective, right? Because there's so much craziness going on with social media or whatever, you can get caught up in this as opposed to really thinking through, why am I here? What really matters? And by the way, one tremendous benefit of this self-reflection and prayer, I believe, is that it minimizes the surprise. I don't know if you've thought about this, but I've come to the conclusion that every person here can determine whether somebody else is self-reflective and prayerful by talking to them for about 15 minutes. The reason for that is that people that are not self-reflective or prayerful are constantly surprised, and you're surprised they're surprised. <laughs> this, is, this is actually true. It's very interesting. I, couple, maybe a couple examples. Um, you can't make this up. So I had... Uh, one student, a student of mine from probably 10 years ago, well, every time I'm at the airport, I run into at least a couple students, and I, I ran into this one fellow, and I said, hey, Joe, how are you doing? He says, well, Professor Kramer, no, no, Harry. Well, Harry, I'm just really surprised. Well, Joe, what are you surprised at? Well, I now have two young boys. I have no relationship with my two sons. I'm really surprised. I said, well, do you spend time with your two sons? No, I don't spend any time with them at all. Well, you're surprised. I'm surprised you're surprised, okay? <laughs> it's very interesting. Here, here's, the, here's the latest one. I had a class, and right before a class started, it was a young woman. I could tell she was a little emotional. I said, Debbie, are you okay? Well, I'm just really surprised. I said, Debbie, what are you surprised by? Well, my grandfather died yesterday, and I was very close to him, and uh, I wanted to spend time with him. I had a whole bunch of insights I wanted to get from his experience, and he suddenly died. It was shocking. I said, well, Debbie, I'm so sorry. And I don't know why, but I just happened to say, well, how old was your grandfather? She said, he was 102 years old. <laughs> now, I didn't say anything, but I was kind of wondering, you're surprised that he died? Okay. Uh, 
And what you all may do, and you may want to do this at, while you're at this conference, because somebody may call you, you may be talking to a friend. The next time, and try this on the next day or two, the next time somebody says they're surprised, just sort of say to them, oh, why are you surprised? They will tell you, and I guarantee you, you're probably going to say to yourself, I'm surprised you're surprised. <laughs> try it. It's, it's fascinating. So, self-reflection. This is huge. This is huge. The second one is balance. Now, the way this balance one works is interesting. Um, we could talk about any topic today. We could talk about the situation in North Korea. We could talk about the Middle East. We could talk about immigration. You name the topic. And amazing to me, many, many people have very strong opinions, very strong opinions. The problem I realize is that many people with strong opinions have virtually no understanding of perspectives other than their own. They know theirs, but they have no understanding of other perspectives. And the second principle, in my mind, for leadership, to being a strong leader, is these are people, hopefully there's a lot in the room, that have a balanced perspective. What does that mean? You literally take the time to understand all sides of a story. And by the way, I slow down to say all sides because the mistake I made when I first started teaching was I said, the value-based leader takes the time to understand the other side. And one of these very bright students said, does that mean there's only two sides? There's multiple sides to the story, right? Or I always love to quote St. Francis. I do this every day. His whole comment of what a real value-based person does is you seek to understand before you're understood. You seek to understand before you're understood. If you're the folks on my team, I may have a view, but I'm not going to talk about my view until I truly understand each of your perspectives. And by the way, the way you can kind of train yourself to this, if I'm having a discussion with you, I try to never say, well, I don't understand where you're coming from, because I actually think that's ignorant. If I take the time, I can understand. Then I'll decide, do I agree or disagree, right? But I really, truly want to know what people think. Right? Why? If I'm having a discussion with you, I think there's three reasons. And assuming we're having a debate and the discussion is on this topic, you know, do we go east or west? All right? And I actually think the answer is east. You think it's west. Well, I really want to understand why you think it's west. Why? First of all, I think a value-based person, I care enough about you, I really want to respect your view. Second, I want to understand why you think it's west, because if I really, truly seek to understand, if West makes more sense than East, I'm just going to say, hey, forget about East. We're going to go West. Because as a value-based leader, I have absolutely no need to be right. I'm fanatically focused on trying to do the right thing. And the third reason is, if I think it's East and you think it's West, I seek to understand. I really understand. And I decide, you know what? Based on my views, based on my faith, whatever, I still think the answer is East. Because I took the time I did to understand your perspective. I actually think you'll take the time to understand my perspective, and I could actually convince you that my way of thinking is right. Okay? So this, this ability to look at things in a balanced way, I think is huge. I think it's huge. Now, this uh, balance piece and self-reflection, if you really think about these two, it really helps an awful lot. And interestingly enough, this balance impacts almost everything you do in your life, and there's a, an expression that often people hear, maybe show of hands, it doesn't, doesn't matter where I am, when I ask questions, how many people have heard of this? It's a big topic. How many of you have heard of this topic called work-life balance? Well, show of hands. Yeah, maybe it's my mathematical training, but I always find this to be one of the bizarrest expressions, all right? And here's why. I'm going to say it out loud. When I do, say it to yourself silently as I say it slowly out loud. Work-life balance. Now, maybe I'm misreading something, but it sounds like you're either working or you're living, okay? I'd say it's very confusing. So I, about 30 years ago, I stopped talking about work-life balance. To me, it's all about life balance. And what are the important things in your life, right? We're all racing around. But are you spending enough time constantly with the Lord? Are you spending time with your family? Are you spending time with people that really matter, that are encouraging and helping your faith, all right? Or are we doing a lot of things that maybe we don't need to be doing? either as much of or, or at all. And the reason these two go together, and maybe you've seen this in your careers already as, as young professionals, it's very, very interesting. I get asked almost every day by somebody, you know, Harry, I'm having trouble balancing things. I'm really having trouble balancing things. My observation is the great majority of people that are having trouble balancing their lives have not been self-reflective enough to figure out what they're trying to balance. 
right? If you haven't figured out what really is important, well then, how, do you, how could you possibly balance it, right? So understanding what really matters to you really, really matters. And this whole idea of a surprise becomes very, very important because I'm realizing there's an amazing number of people that are doing things, even intelligent people, they don't even realize what they're doing and why. And I'll, and I'll give you an example. I had a, a, a very, very senior executive I worked with who came into my office one day and he said, Harry, I, I really need to talk to you. I'm having trouble with my marriage, my three children. Uh, Harry, I'd really like to talk to you. I said, well, I have no answers. I, I just have opinions, no, but you have five children. Uh, I know you're a strong Catholic. I, I, I just like to talk to you. I said, well, happy to talk to you. Uh, I'll tell you what, tomorrow's Saturday. Uh, why don't you come on over to the house and we can chat about in the backyard. Well, tomorrow, it won't work tomorrow because uh, tomorrow I'm golfing. I said, okay, well, hey, Sunday after Mass, do you want to get, well, I'm golfing on Sunday, all right? Now, because the, being the math guy that I am, I'm thinking it takes five hours to do. You're doing it twice, that's 10 hours. Now, you're surprised you got a problem. Now, now, by the way, here's how open I try to be. If golfing for you is more important than your spouse or your kids, well, then you won't be surprised. But I'm actually surprised you're surprised, okay? <laughs> uh, and I can give you a million examples of this. You know, where, when people say, I wish I had more time, well, we've all got the same amount of time. We've all got the same amount of time. In fact, I, I, I tease students all the time. How many people study math here? Any, any math folks in the room? Thank you. M many don't admit it, so I appreciate that. That's, that's great. Uh, as math people, we have favorite numbers, all right? Favorite numbers. My all-time favorite number, I think about this number every day, is 168. It's an amazingly important number. It turns out about one out of 10 people know the answer to this. I'll ask for a volunteer in a minute, but something happened a couple weeks ago. I want to make sure we don't embarrass anybody. One guy raised his hand at one of these sessions a couple weeks ago, and he said, I know the answer. He said, what is it? He said, 168. He said, is it, it's, a, it's a prime number. <laughs> it ends in an eight, for goodness sake, OK? <laughs> it's not, I mean, that, that really hurts your soul to hear this, OK? No, no it's not a prime number. Volunteer, somebody, the critical, yes, sir. Hours in a week, yes. The number of hours in a week. And it's very interesting, about one out of 10 people, but if I say to, to somebody, this young woman, uh, how hard are you working this week? She says, this week, I'm working 24 seven. What, the, can they not multiply? I mean, <laughs> carry the two, it's always 168, most of the time, right, all right? So everybody in this room has 168 hours, all right? And what I think you have to do is, when somebody says to me, well, Harry, I'd like to do it, I don't have the time, in a very respectful way, I usually say, oh, you have the time. You got 168 hours. Now, if it's not a priority for you, that's okay. That's okay. But, but where are you spending time? And if there are things that you would really like to do, if you'd like to spend more time on helping grow this organization, well, I don't know if I got the time. Well, here's a couple thoughts. You know, every time you golf, that's five hours, all right? One of the things that Julie told me, because I get most of my ideas from Julie, who not only went to college, but then we both went to school together as well, business school. Um, she always said, Harry, this was about 30 years ago, she said, Harry, you keep talking about this 168. Now we have two children on the way to three. We want to have at least five. Harry, uh, you know, what, what gives here? Uh, I've got an idea. I said, what's that? She said, what, what are we doing that literally we say we're going to do for an hour and it takes three or four hours and we don't get much out of it and it's not good for the kids anyway. I said, what's that? She said, television. She said, we ought to just stop watching television. I had bad reaction to this because I'm thinking, hey, I'm trying to know what's going on. I need to know the news. She said, Harry, you're reading the New York Times, the Financial Times every day. Harry, the only thing you miss by watching television is, you know, Jojo the Giraffe Escape from the Zoo. News at 11. I mean, you miss nothing. Okay, well, then I got, okay, fine. So, the last time I've watched television was 30 years ago. You save an amazing amount of time by not watching television, right? Now, students will say to me sometimes, what about sports? What about sports? Okay, uh, what about sports? So rather than answering it, I, I just give them a question, which is this. Are you going to exercise? Or are you going to watch other people exercise? <laughs> it's, just, it's just a question. It's just a question. And by the way, if you've got, you got a special team, you want to watch them two hours a week, you know, super. That's part of a balanced life, right? I have two brothers. They watch people exercise at least 20 hours a week. I'm convinced of it. Okay. All day Saturday, all day Sunday. But because I love my brothers, and by the way, you're going to manage your 168 different than you, different than me. There's no, no final conclusion, right? You have to, everybody has to do it their own. But I said, Steve, as long as you're happy, that's okay. No problem. Steve made a mistake of saying, well, I'm not happy. I'm not happy. I said, why are you not happy? I'll tell you why I'm not happy. 
That guy's batting 210. <laughs> they're paying him $35 million a year. And he said, I don't understand how they're paying him $35 million a year. Well, as the economist in the family, I explained it to him. How? Because you're watching him. <laughs> you know, you're drinking Miller Lite, eating potato chips. They can pay the guy $35 million, okay? Now, whether you decide to watch television or not, whether you decide to golf or not, that's fine. But you got to just think through what are you going to do, what are you not going to do, right? And this 168, I have to tell you, really drives my children crazy. It they, they really does. I have to tell you, there's pros and cons with this because when my children were just like 13, 14, and they said, hey, Dad, we'd really like to go to Mass with you, but I just don't have the time. I said, well, tell me, do you, do you really believe in, in Jesus? Do you really believe in the Catholic? Oh, Harry, no, I believe that, truly, and I, I, but I just don't have the time. I said, all right, well, take out your calculator, okay? What is one hour divided by 168? I think it's like 0.89 of 1%. Now, if something's important to you and you can't spend even 1% of your time, we have a little bit of a problem, okay? So what's important, what isn't? What's your life balance? What are you going to do? What are you not going to do? All right? How important is this stuff? Self-reflection, balance. The third one is true self-confidence. Now, leaders, executive students will always say, what's the true thing? I mean, you're either self-confident uh, self or not. Well, no show of hands, but many of us have worked for people who can act very self-confident, who have no self-confidence at all. You've run into these people. This is the macho, do what I told you to do, I've never made a mistake crowd. No, no, no. I'm talking about true self-confidence. And people, you can think about this one, you can jot it down, take a nice walk outside. Do you have true self-confidence? And I've come up with two questions, if you want to get serious about this sometime, to decide, do you have true self-confidence? Here you go. First question. Whatever your role, whatever you do, whatever your education, have you yet reached a point in your life where you're comfortable to say, I don't know? I don't know. Father, I don't know. You tell me how fast you did answer. I'll get you an answer, but I don't happen to know. I'm not going to wing it. I'm not going to pretend, but, but I'll get you an answer. I, I've got a great network, but, but I just don't happen to know. Are you willing to admit what you don't know? Question number two. Whatever your role, whatever you're doing, have you reached a point in your life where you're comfortable to say, I was wrong? Forget what I said, which information makes sense. Let's do that. Are you willing to admit that you were wrong? Now, here's a very interesting, simple thought. Most of my thoughts are very, very simple. Why is it that so many of us don't want to admit we don't know and don't want to admit when we are wrong? Why is that? Well, here's my guess. If you're my boss, and I say I don't know, I may be worried you may not think very highly of me. I may not be one of your best people, right? Well, let's go back to my little equation again. If leadership is about the ability to influence people, and the way you influence people is you relate to people, interestingly enough, it's been shown, most people do not relate well to people who know everything. Most people don't relate well to people that never make a mistake. How do you relate to these people? They're not even human, right? But <laughs> If, I say to, if you say to me, Harry, what's the answer? I say, well, hey, I, I don't know, but you tell, me, you tell me how quickly you need an answer. I'll get you an answer. I think you may say, you know, hey, Harry's a regular guy. I can relate to him. Ah, if you can relate to me, I can influence you and I can lead you. It works the opposite of what most people fear. Now, just because I don't want to, uh, I want to make sure that I'm very clear, there's a balance here, right? Go back to balance for a minute. Uh, because if you're my boss and if every time you ask a question, I say I don't know, I have a larger problem. Okay? I will be unemployed, right? So there's a balance. There's a balance. There's always a balance, okay? So this whole idea of true self-confidence, you know what you know, you know what you don't know, right? Now, I have had very senior executives, including CEOs, say to me, you know, the self-reflection, prayer, I, I want to think more about that. This balance, I really want to think more about this. This true self-confidence, I got a real problem. Got a real problem. I said, well, Sam, what's the problem? Well, he said, Harry, I got 800 people working for me. There is no way I want them to know what I don't know. I keep my cards very close to the vest. I am not going to divulge what I don't know to these people. What do you think of that? Of course, I'm the guy who's got to explain to this guy, they already know what you don't know. <laughs> right? No show of hands, but how many people in this room have worked for somebody that you could write a book on what they don't know? I could write some pretty big books, okay? Uh, but at the end of the day, you might as well admit because that actually attracts people to you because you're being human. You're being, you're, you're being human, right? So that, that ability to openly do that. And by the way, just to, I always try to give you guys a little bit of um, practical advice. This is one that my, um, my boss told me one time, which I think is really valuable. 
as all of you are thinking about your career and you're trying to really think about your whole career and doing it in the presence of God, it's very, very interesting that some people would say, unless you know everything else about the next job, hard to get promoted unless you know everything about that next job. And I had a boss who said to me, you know, Harry, any job you're ever in today or will ever be in the future, there's really only two things you ever have to know. And I said, Mr. Graham, what, what, what is it? He said, you only need to know two things. The first thing you have to know is what are your God-given skill sets? What are the talents he's given you? That's the first thing you have to know. The other thing you have to know is who knows what you don't know? I said, Mr. Graham, this is going to work out great. I got like 40 guys who know what I don't know. I keep them very close. Right? So when you're starting off in your career, there's a lot of discussion about how much you know. But after seven, 10 years, it's all about really almost two things. Do you know who knows what you don't know? And do they want to work with you? And if that's true, you're going to do really well. Right? This sounds like a humility thing, but there were many, many other people at Baxter that were a lot brighter than I was. I, had two, I only had two really good things going for me. I really knew who the really good people were, and I got to the point they all wanted to work for me. <laughs> You're going to do incredibly well. It's like building a team. Self-reflection, balance, true self-confidence, <coughs> final, genuine humility. So I never say self-confidence without true. I never say humility without genuine, okay? Now, one of these very bright students in the first class said to me when we talked about genuine humility, they said, well, how do you know if you have genuine humility? And if you think you have it, do you really have it? <laughs> that was a great question. So I had to develop another question. So I'll give you guys the question that I ask people all around the world, different skill sets, junior people, CEOs, anywhere in between. Here, here's the question. It's a perfect question, I think. Whatever you've accomplished so far in your schoolwork, in your careers, whatever you've done so far, how did you get to where you are so far? How did you get to where you are so far? Very interesting. Having done this now hundreds of times, it amazes me, I almost always get the same top two responses. Harry, how did I get to where I am? Well, I worked very hard. I worked very, very hard, and I have certain skill sets. Okay? And the combination of working hard and skill sets that's how I got to where I am. Now, if I personally think about this quickly, okay, um, I could say, oh, I work pretty hard. I, I have several skill sets, okay? But now that we're all self-reflective and prayerful, maybe there's a couple other things that, that come to mind, right? And I'll, and I'll break it up into really uh, two groups, right? In my mind, if somebody doesn't have a, a strong Catholic Christian faith, but you were at least self-reflective, you could say, well, how about luck? How about timing? How about having great team members? How about mentors? Okay, but I think the easiest one for me is to realize, wait a minute, that's very simple. These are all the talents that Jesus gave me. All right, these are, I, I, all I'm trying to do is use the talents I was given. It's not about me, okay? It's not about me, it's all about him. So, you know, I, I will never ever forget that. Now, whether, whether somebody gets that yet or not, but they realize it goes way beyond if you happen to be bright or not. The way I always describe it is, as a value-based leader, you never forget where you came from. You keep things in perspective. At Baxter, we always used to say, you don't read your own press clippings. If a little story about yourself, put it in a book, but who knows, it may not even be true. We got this false news thing floating around, I'm, I don't even know anymore, okay? <laughs> and then the last one, and you guys, some of you guys are young enough, but the more experienced people will tell you this, I really do believe that the higher up somebody goes in an organization, whatever your field, the higher up you go, I highly recommend you to make sure you surround yourself with people who knew you before you became a big shot. Because on the way to becoming a big shot, there are people, I guarantee you, that are gonna start to say, oh, Harry, you're amazing, you're remarkable. And the problem is, you could actually start to believe it, okay? And if you forget it's all a gift from him, you can get yourself pretty lost. And it's funny, I always think to myself, if you look over here, if you look at that doorway, okay, I don't know how many of you have experienced it, but if you look at the size of that doorway, I literally know people who physically could not get their head through that door, okay? <laughs> I could. And you say to yourself, hey, we played a little basketball, had a couple of beers. What happened to these people? Well, very simple. They actually believe it's all about them. If you believe it's all about you and you forget about what Jesus has given us, you got a real problem. Not only spiritually, but from a business standpoint, Go back one more time to the equation. 
If leadership is about the ability to influence people, and the way you influence people is you relate to people, it turns out most people do not relate well to egomaniacs. They just don't, right? So that realization that every single person on this earth matters and is important. And the reason I say genuine, and some of you folks have seen this in your careers already, there are people who will say everybody's important, but then you watch how they treat people, and it's like a caste system. Okay, well, I, I don't talk to those people anymore. I, I'm up here. As opposed to every single person matters. And the, and the example I use in class on this one, I spend half my time teaching and half my time uh, I'm an investor in, in healthcare companies. And uh, we have an office on the 46th floor uh, in Chicago in one of the big buildings. And it's very, very interesting if uh, I'm working late on something, we're doing an initial public offering or buying or selling a company, and we're there late, I, at least in my building, I always know when it's exactly 10 o'clock. Because my office is right next to the elevator, and exactly at 10 o'clock, these three women get off the elevator on the 46th floor. It's the cleaning crew, right, these three women. Now, I always say hello to them. I don't speak Polish, they don't speak English. I thank them for coming by. I show them pictures of my five kids, and I don't take more than 10 minutes, probably. But in 10 minutes, I can empty out the trash baskets in seven or eight of the offices with them. And I always remember, every time I do it, almost in a prayer, I think to myself, you know what? If it wasn't for the blessings I've had, I could very easily be part of the cleaning crew, right? And I'm going to thank them for everything that they're doing. And I always tell the students, it's a tremendous win-win, because I think it's the right thing that Jesus would want us to do. And at the same time, just from a practical business standpoint, it's exactly what you'd want to do to build a team. Because people really relate to you. And of course, Julie always teases me when I come home late at night because I've always got a collection of these Polish cakes and cookies and all this stuff. Like that. <laughs> these, are, these are like my buddies, okay? So, so that ability to realize it's a journey, it's a journey, I can always get better, you know, it's, I don't separate out this from my life, because it is my life, and I, I, I think Brother Lawrence summarizes it so incredibly well. I've already read that booklet twice already. Uh, and this whole concept of on my journey, can I become more self-reflective? Can I become more balanced? Can I develop true self-confidence and genuine humility? And if I can do those things, I can do a much better job of leading myself. And if I can lead myself, I, I can really lead others. Okay, so that is the, uh, that's the short version of my 30-hour class, okay? <laughs> so coming back, this self-reflection piece, I think is exactly in line with what I think Brother Lawrence is asking us to do. We're not separating anything out. We're not waiting for anything. And at the end of the day, we're going to do what we need to do and what he's called us to do each and every moment of, of every day. Now, uh, I'd be more than happy if we have a couple minutes, more than happy to take a couple questions. Um, be more than happy to. Yeah, on anything, maybe your name and where you're from. What it was what now? The best mistake you've ever made and what have you learned from it? <sighs> wow. Uh, the question was, what was the biggest mistake? Yeah, or best, yeah. Best mistake. Well, um, there's, a, there's been a couple thousand of them. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I think, well, some of the ones that have been, had, had the biggest impact on me early on was feeling that uh, I needed to be the brightest person or that I'm the one who needed to give my opinion. And early on, um, people didn't want to work for me because, you know, oh, he's this just smart guy. And, or he's, okay, he's got five people now working for him, but he's, he wants to be the genius with these followers. Uh, and until I took the time to realize this really is not about me, um, and I really will be on my teams the last person to talk, um, that had an enormous impact on, on people wanting to work for me. Uh, and the other thing I realized was once you realize it's all about the team, and you realize it's not about you, it's very, very interesting because early on I thought, well, I have to prove how good I am. And then I realized, well, wait a minute, no. If I can prove how good everybody that's working with me, how good they are, then those folks are going to want to work for me and we're going to do very, very well. So, so in my mind, an awful lot of it is the St. Francis seek to understand before. That's why I reinforce that on myself every day, every day. What else? Yes, what's your name? Where are you from? Kelly from New Orleans, yes. 
How many other people are from New Orleans? All right, okay. I was just at the uh, World War II Museum. Unbelievable, unbelievable, yeah. So, excuse me, my question is, when you're ga engaging in a conversation and you're trying to understand the other person's point of view, but you know that what they're arguing is against your beliefs and values, mm -hmm. how do you approach that topic? Sure. How do you try and understand them? Yeah, okay, so that's a, that's a great question. So, uh, and thank goodness, thank goodness, I always say opinion because other people can look at different ways. Different people, and, I, and I'm very sincere when I, very, very sincere, because I love you guys to be very honest. There are some people who take the position of, okay, this is what I believe, and I'm going to let people know right away, and that's the way it's going to be. I, 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 I appreciate that perspective. I have always found that doesn't draw people uh, to, to Christ, I don't think. So I find, even if they have a different view, I, I really want to understand. I want to understand why they believe that. And I'll even take notes, and I will take the time to understand it. But to your point, there are times when they'll go through that, and I'll realize, well, no, this is, this is exactly what it is. And I will always then say, hey, uh, as a result of me taking all these notes and, and understanding what, why, why you believe this, uh, can I, can I is, is it okay if I share with you my perspective? And because I know what they've said, then it gives me the ability to much stronger, strongly come up with an argument as to why maybe they ought to think about it differently. Now, I don't always convince them, but I at least draw them in because I, I really believe if I, can, if I can draw them in, I can actually have a, maybe a better chance of trying to convince them. Right? This is a crazy, I always think of these crazy simple analogies, so this is the one I, I, I immediately think of. I don't know if this helps or not, but here, here's sort of the crazy way I think about it, okay? Uh, it's almost like, crazy analogy, you got all these people on the shore, okay? They're not Christian, they're not Catholic, they, they're, they're welcome to the world we're living in today, right? And I'm in this boat, okay? Now, I, I kind of have two choices. I can be out like 500 feet from shore and explain, these are the rules, this is the way it is, maybe. I don't think I'm going to get many people in the boat. Or I can get the boat all the way to shore and tell them, hey, I'm willing to listen. I want to understand. I'll just seek to understand your perspective. I get them in the boat. I think I've got a reasonable shot of maybe convincing them how they ought to change how, how they live their life. That's the way I think about it. Other people don't view it that way. But I, I, I tell you, I, I'll give you a crazy example. I will often uh, get into a discussion and somehow... Uh, there's a million examples, I'm sure you guys live these, but the one that, uh, that I feel like I have some impact on these days is when we get into this topic of abortion, right? And uh, it usually starts off of, well, you know, Harry, uh, you need to understand, you know, this is my right as a woman, it's my body, and, and all these other things, okay? And I'm understanding, I'm, I'm writing notes down and everything else, and, uh, and I'll just say, well, what, what, what do you, how do you think about this? And I'm gonna, I'll try to be, whatever you want to think it is at this time. And it says, well, you know, Harry, obviously, after X amount of weeks, well, then, then I would never do it. And I said, well, okay, so let me make sure I understand this. So at, pick a number. At, at, at week 15, would, you wouldn't do it, but at week 14, you would. I said, well, here's what I'm a little confused. I mean, you can help me. Is the only difference between this, per, this whatever you want to call it, at 10 weeks and 15 weeks, is time. So, so have you thought through, if time is the only difference, what, how, do you, how could you possibly think about this? And then one woman, a couple weeks later, called me and said, you know what? Uh, I, I actually realize I'm not thinking about this the right way. I said, well, I'll tell you this much. Think about it this way. From the moment of conception, the only difference between whatever you think it is and a human being is time. And I happen to think it's a human being at exactly that time of conception. And I probably convinced four or five people of that. As opposed to, you know what? Abortion's murder, and uh, that's it. Well, I don't get, you don't get the chance to convince many people of things. Right? But a little bit of that is your own approach, and everybody's going to look at it differently. I, I really believe that many people believe things because nobody has taken the time to listen to them, seek to understand, and then use that information to convince them of something different. That's the way I think about it. But everybody does it differently. Yes, sir. What's your name? What do you, what do, you do? I mean, what, where do you live? Jack, I'm from Cleveland. Cleveland, okay. I appreciate you sharing sort of your journey and the tension between seeking majus but also humility. You know that. I'm sorry. Say it again. The Ignatian principle of majus or, or seeking more, mm -hmm. but yet also anchoring that with humility. 
So in your value-based uh, desire to be a leader, are you more motivated by the process or by the outcome? Because I, I, it seems as though um, that type of leadership, like value-based leadership, really you fall in love with the process of what you do. Is that true? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, in, in, in my mind, in my mind, if, if, if I'm living the life that I think Jesus wants me to, and I'm constantly keeping this in link with what Brother Lawrence is talking about, um, everything else is gonna work out. In fact, I'll give you, you, you raise a great point. Here's, here's the way I think about this, because I keep it very simple. Um, here's something that I think, if we're honest, everybody in this room, we all deal with, right? Uh, things like worry, fear, anxiety, pressure, and let's not forget about stress. Now. What do you know, anybody, what do you know about worry, fear, anxiety, pressure, and stress? What do you know about these things? Anybody? Not healthy? Unproductive? You kill, kill you? Now here's the problem. If you wait until you're in the middle of the problem, it's too late. It's too late, right? But what I realized was, if you're self-reflective and you really take the time to think about it, you're not going to be surprised as often. So I would almost argue, wait a minute, wait a minute, why would I deal with these problems when they've already occurred, because it's too late? Why don't I think about these things before they happen, right? So I often tease students, I have yet to meet the person whose life goes like this. It just gets better and better and better. Maybe that's you, I mean, most of us it's like this, right? So here's a question I ask myself. When things are going remarkably well, if it's a wave, right, we all have highs and lows, when things are going unbelievably well, what's the one thing you know for sure when things are going unbelievably well? It's got to go down. It's got to go down, okay? Or we'd be, or we'd be with this fellow, okay, like that. Now, so here's the question I ask myself. What am I going to do? This had an enormous impact on me from reflection prayer. When things are going unbelievably well, what am I going to do? I decided I'm going to have gratitude. I'll be thankful. I'll thank God for everything that's done. I'll share that, that, I'll give credit to everybody, we'll really enjoy the moment, but before the party ends, I'll ask myself the question, what are we going to do when, not if, what are we going to do when things turn down? And I know this sounds overly simple, but I convinced myself about 40 years ago in my very first retreat, no matter what happens tomorrow, no matter what happens tomorrow, I will do two things. I will, number one, try to do the right thing of what Jesus would expect me to do with a lot of people's help because I better find some really good people that'll help me. And number two, I'll do the best I can do. I'll try to do the right thing, I'll do the best I can do. I'll try to do the right thing, I'll do the best I can do. So here we are, we're all together Friday. Now, picture your worst, I don't know what's gonna happen tomorrow, I don't think you do. Now, what's my worst nightmare for tomorrow? But my worst nightmare for tomorrow is probably something happens to Julie or one of my five children. I hope it doesn't happen, but if it does, I already know what I'm going to do. I'll try to do the right thing. I'll do the best I can do. And it's very interesting. If you can absolutely convince yourself of that, I would argue worry, fear, anxiety, pressure, and stress can be significantly reduced. It can't be eliminated, right? First of all, we're human, and I think Jesus is testing us constantly, constantly testing us, all right? And we've all had bosses that would say, you know, a little bit of pressure is not all bad. The problem is we got a lot more than a little bit. So, so that ability to put things into perspective has an enormous impact, enormous impact. Because we're all going to go through highs and lows. There's going to be good days and bad days, right? But once you put it in perspective, you can, get, you can actually get through anything. And I think that's, that's a big, big piece of this. Okay, I see him standing up here. That basically means I have my last comment to make. As you're coming up the steps, no pressure, no pressure whatsoever, however, you are those guys, so good luck. Okay. <laughs>